Gary Brown was nearly ripped apart during a deadly chimp attack on a sightseeing trip in West Africa. He turned and started screaming and charged. I didn't know that they get the, up to the strength of seven men. On the west coast of Africa, deep in a Sierra Leone rainforest, a large captive colony of chimpanzees lives peacefully on the 100-acre Takugama Chimpanzee Sanctuary. Bruno, a 200-pound alpha male, is the colony's leader. An alpha male is the, the term used to describe the highest ranking male chimpanzee. <laughs> The alpha male is the chimpanzee who can win a fight with the other males. In the wild, Bruno would rule a territory at least 50 times the size of the Takugama sanctuary. Less than 40 minutes away, Texan telecommunications engineer Gary Brown is enjoying a day off at his hotel. Working here is a dream come true. They're hiring in Africa. Anybody want to go to Africa? And I held my hand up and said, I'll do it. I wanted to work overseas. Yeah, let's do it. This weekend, Gary's decided to head up to the mountains with a colleague, along with his friend Melvin Mama and their driver, Isa. I said, my days off is going to be spent going and seeing Africa, the real Africa. Isa drives them deep in the rainforest towards the Takugama chimp sanctuary. <laughs> he had told me for two weeks before about this place, and, and other Americans had said, yeah, you got to go up there and get pictures or something to see. It's the largest chimp refuge in the world. Bruno is the alpha male. He's so big. Yes, sir, I'm from Texas. We grow prairie dogs bigger than any eight. <laughs> <laughs> You'll be glad he's behind an electric fence. Yeah. At the Takugama Sanctuary, Bruno keeps a close eye on his keepers. If you're in captivity, you spend a lot of time just watching. And they would see these locks being opened and uh, closed many times a day and be watching very carefully to see how to get out. <laughs> the chimpanzees presumably took a rock and banged it against the lock. The chimps in this part of the world know how to use rocks. Very few other animals do that. Uh, chimpanzees and humans are really the tool making and tool using masters. No one knows for sure how it happened, but it's a breakout. Bruno and 30 other chimps escaped their enclosure and head for the sanctuary's perimeter fence and the jungle beyond. This is really the first taste of freedom that this chimpanzee has had. Unaware of the breakout, Gary and his friends continue to the chimp sanctuary. look up in the mountains and you just mesmerize the trees, the size of the trees, the canopy. Bruno rips through the dense jungle. This is his territory now. He was exploring his world, seeing what world outside the sanctuary was like. And 
Han is probably afraid. Like the other chimps at the sanctuary, Bruno was brought here as an orphan. His mother was killed in the controversial bushmeat trade. In Sierra Leone, like much of the rest of Africa, people eat chimpanzees and other primates for food. They would have seen their mother and probably other members of their community shot and killed when they were young. The chimpanzees would have that experience. They would remember strangers coming. Uh, they would remember the gunfire. And it's probably a, a reasonable assumption on the chimpanzee's part that a strange human being is a dangerous creature. Bruno hears an approaching car. The chimp immediately sizes up the situation. All of a sudden, out of the brush, this big black thing jumped out. First thing I thought was, cool, you know, I'm seeing something in the wild. Windows. Turn the windows up. Slow down, man. Slow down. Jesus. Issa quickly recognizes that the huge chimp is charging. It's time to get out. Issa. He just threw the car in reverse and just took off backwards. But fleeing only makes things worse. He caught up and he was level with the front window. Bruno seems to have disappeared. And all of a sudden, it was just like an explosion. A chimpanzee that's 120 pounds is gonna be mostly bone and muscle with not a lot of fat. So you have a very compact and powerful creature. Fighting for their lives, they somehow managed to shove the furious chimp out the window. Melvin's hand has been bitten to shreds. Right here, all this was gone. If you run, you're showing that you're afraid of him, you're weak, and he'll take advantage of that. Basically, what they're doing is they're doing damage to whatever they can get a hold of and whatever is exposed to them. Not only is Melvin losing a lot of blood, but bacteria from Bruno's saliva could be spreading through his bloodstream. With two-inch fangs and jaw muscles three times denser than in humans, a chimp's bite can be deadly. They need to get to a hospital fast. And we were yelling at him, Slow down, he said. Find a place to turn around. Turn around. We got to get out of here. Panicking, he misses a vital turnoff. They're lost. Terrified, they hit a dead end. There was a gate that stood probably 10 to 12 feet tall. <laughs> with their savage attacker hot on their trail. I couldn't believe what was happening to us. They only have one option. We stopped. The collision kills the engine. This car isn't going anywhere. But Bruno hasn't finished protecting his new territory. 
when they tried to escape, that showed the chimpanzee that they were afraid and vulnerable and may well have triggered a chase response. There it is. It's coming back. In the Sierra Leone rainforest, American Gary Brown and his party have been attacked by an enormous chimp. I was blacked out, knocked out. I don't know whatever, but I lost a little bit of time. I don't remember people getting out of the car. Horrified, he spots Melvin on the ground. Bruno is chewing him apart. The chimp takes Melvin's foot in his mouth and bites down. Gary's adrenaline kicks in. I was angry. Angry and just mad. Instead of running, I just started looking for a weapon. That's when I lost it. I had enough. And everything that came over me, came through me, all of a sudden I had total clarity. When the chimpanzee saw Gary standing his ground, he would have seen an opponent who was not afraid, an opponent who was angry, and an opponent who could really inflict some damage of his own. I had the tree turned up and was ramming him. And he was trying to get up, and I kept ramming him on the ground. It was a very powerful and hurtful blow. And uh, that was absolutely the right thing to do, because it convinced the chimp that if it kept up this attack, it was going to get hurt. Suddenly, Bruno bolts off. The fight was over with him, because he kept his back to me. And what I seen when I ta we attacked each other, eye contact, Facial expressions, I was totally gone on him now. Melvin is badly wounded. His foot is completely mangled. He's bleeding to death. And he goes, I'm going to die here. And I told him, I said, no, when you die here, I die here with you. I'm not leaving you. He's my friend, you know. And there's no sign anywhere of their driver. Where's this one? He went to help. We gotta go. We gotta go. I could hear chimpanzees everywhere. We were totally surrounded. We took off, off down the mountain. These chimps never jumped out. They stayed in the jungle. I kept looking ahead. Finally, we made it out. We made it to the road, the main road. More than an hour later, a passing truck picks them up and takes them to a nearby hospital. Later that day, Gary learns that Issa was mauled to death by the other runaway chimps. Doctors are unable to save Melvin's foot and three of his fingers. During five minutes, don't go by, I don't see it. I'm going to have to picture it in my head every day the rest of my life. If you get bit by a snake or a shark or something, it's, it's kind of impersonal, and you sort of expect it. But for a chimpanzee, something that is clearly very similar to us in lots of ways, it, it would just seem a lot more personal, I'm sure. I have no misconceptions. I know Bruno could have taken me apart in a heartbeat. He could have taken me. I think I, he was just off guard. Of the 31 chimpanzees that escaped the sanctuary, 27 were recaptured or returned on their own. Four, including Bruno, 
are still on the loose. Gary Brown's case is not unique. In May 2007, a silverback male gorilla named Boquito escaped from a Rotterdam zoo. Petronella Yvonne the Horde was a regular visitor. She adored Boquito. She visited him four times a week, always smiling and making eye contact. She felt she had a special bond with the 400-pound gorilla. But on May 18, 2007, Boquito somehow escaped. He headed straight for Petronella. To a gorilla, a toothy smile is an act of aggression. And now, it was payback. Boquito dragged her around the zoo, breaking her arm and wrist. Visitors locked themselves in the cafeteria for safety. Boquito broke down the door, sending tables and chairs flying. Eventually, he was shot with a tranquilizer dart. Petronella never fully healed. Apes are by no means the most dangerous animals in captivity. Some would argue that honor belongs to the tiger. It can slay any human in its path with a single bite. Despite their deadly reputation, people still try to contain and control these remarkable creatures. In the 1920s, when touring circuses and wild animal acts were all the rage, Mabel Stark was the Tiger Queen. She would take 18 tigers at a time into the ring, but not even the Tiger Queen could conquer the basic instincts of a hardwired killer. She was attacked 18 times. The worst took place in 1928 at a show in Bangor, Maine. Stalking her from behind, one of her beloved cats lashed out at her left leg, almost severing it above the knee. Smelling blood, a second tiger jumped off his pedestal and pushed Mabel to the ground, mauling her savagely. Although doctors felt she would never survive, Mabel miraculously recovered and was eventually back in the ring with the animals she loved. As Mabel knew all too well, containing tigers is a risky business. Animal lover Jan Gold was also savaged by a captive tiger. When it broke free at a zoo, her lavish fundraising dinner turned into a living nightmare. He just reached up and grabbed my back. He bit into my head, and the next thought was, am I going to survive this? Zoo Boise is one of the most popular attractions in southern Idaho. The stars here are brothers Taiga and Tundra, a newly arrived pair of two-year-old, 600-pound Siberian tigers. Also known as Amor Tigers, they are at the zoo to provide an important gene pool to help ensure the survival of the species. Tigers are highly endangered. There are now more of them living in captivity than in the wild. But keeping one of the world's most deadly hunters behind bars comes with big risks. There have been at least 45 deaths by tigers in captivity of humans over the last 10 years and there have been 115 injuries serious enough to make the media. Tonight, Jan is helping to stage a fundraiser called the Feast for the Beast, a name that will soon prove darkly ironic. This was the largest fundraiser at the zoo. So there was gonna be a silent auction, a live auction, some entertainment. All of this was uh, on the park grounds at the zoo. The money will help build better facilities for the zoo's animals. I believe in 
doing what I can for the animals. I love animals. It's always been a fascination for me. In the wild, taiga and tundra would roam a territory 18 times the size of Manhattan. They are natural-born killers who can never be completely tamed. They can slaughter with a single bite. You can see animals at zoos, for example, that look at children running back and forth in front of the cages. There is an interest in chasing these children. Nearby in the tiger enclosure, taiga and tundra are getting increasingly hungry. In the wild, they would learn to kill and eat large prey, even bears. But on the menu tonight is 10 pounds of raw horse meat and vitamins. While the tiger's meal is being prepared, Jan takes care of last minute details. I had to run some errands and pick some items up for the auction that was going to take place that evening. And it was just kind of setting things up. Around the zoo, workers are finishing off their chores. One of the tiger cages is accidentally left unlocked, but no one notices. Hello, everyone. Allison, it's wonderful to see you. Are you enjoying yourself? Excellent. Well, the barbecue should almost be ready, and then it'll be over for you. Excellent. Nightfall, in the zoo's social event of the year, is underway. It's a good turnout. Dinner was kind of buffet style, and then sitting under a tent, and uh, there was a little bit of entertainment, and then we went on to the live auction. In the nearby tiger cage, taiga and tundra are most likely agitated by all the commotion. Unlike the tigers, Jan and the others at the party have already been well fed. And now, it's time to stretch their legs. I got up with some friends, and we just decided to walk around. And we saw the manager walk by. Hello, ladies. Hey. How are you doing? You want to feed the boys? Yeah, that'd be great. Well, that meant he was feeding the tigers. <laughs> that would be great. I'm just going to fall ahead. You guys keep going. Yes, yeah, Steve? We weren't the only ones invited. There were other people, too. Mostly board members or and family of the board members or friends. Jan and her guests are excited. They can't wait to see the big cats feed. Here we go. As I walked down the hall, there was three cages on my right. Jan spots something strange. The last cage, the gate was wide open, and we noticed that. And we just kind of, well, obviously, they must know it's open. And we talked about it, thinking, well, maybe they are going to direct the tigers into the first two cages. <laughs> Instead, one of the tigers is now heading towards the third open cage. And face to face with Jan. All of a sudden, there was a tiger in there. Come on, ladies. How are you doing? You want to feed the boys? At a zoo fundraiser in Boise, Idaho, a cage door has accidentally been left open. And now, board member Jan Gold is face to face with Taiga, a 600 pound Siberian tiger on the loose. It probably never had the door open before. It didn't know what to expect, but it moved forward and it could keep moving forward. <laughs> He 
is 600 pounds. I mean, his head was, you know, into my hip area. That's how tall he was. The tiger was probably as surprised as Jan Gould was that they were face to face. And it didn't know what to do, but it did know there was an animal in front of it. At that point, my focus was seeing if I could get this gate shut and keep the tiger in there. But that's easier said than done. Tiger's still not sure how to react. He may not have even seen her as prey because he had never had any experience with live prey. She was just a moving object. But something deep inside said, this is what I'm supposed to be doing. He's moving toward me. I mean, that's a force moving toward me. It was like a few conscious, slow steps, because he wasn't stopping, and it was, he was right there. Desperate, Jan tries to buy herself some time. I held my purse in front of him, trying to get him distracted. The only thing you can do in that situation is try to distract the tiger. And those who survive often survive because the tiger is distracted. People throw stones or sticks. And that's when I realized the people were leaving. I saw a couple of people with terrified looks on their faces because he wasn't stopping. The tiger hasn't attacked yet, most likely because Jan's looking it in the eyes. You want to look big. You want to face it. In the wild, tigers prefer to attack their prey from behind. Without realizing, Jan makes a tragic mistake. I was down, and it was very surreal. When she turned around, she provided the framework for the tiger to see, aha, this is prey. And it was at that point that 10 million years of evolution kicked in, and it tried to be a tiger. I mean, he just reached up and grabbed my back and just brought me down. When the tiger is attacking a wild animal, it will grab it by the neck and try and drag it down and break the animal's neck and crush the trachea until it can't breathe anymore. And then it often drags it off to feed. I can feel his chest over my back. He bit into my head. And the next thought was, am I going to survive this? His powerful four-inch canines can easily puncture Jan's neck vertebrae, forcing them apart, eventually breaking her spinal cord. He had no experience. He didn't know where to bite, but he bit, and he grabbed her head, and he kept on going. All the others can do is look on in horror. I thought he actually bit through and crushed my skull, and it was so loud. And, and then he came to a point and just stopped, and he held me there. He just sort of held me. A police officer hired as security for the event takes aim. Hey, you gotta shoot the tiger! Shoot the tiger! Get off the hey, hey, for the veteran cop, it's tricky getting a clean shot. He fires slightly over Tiger's head just to scare him off. Startled, Tiger retreats to his cage and is finally locked up. The bullets was enough to surprise the Tiger to move back. It had never experienced something like this. Unfortunately, in the shootout, a bullet has accidentally struck Jan in the hip, shattering the top of her femur. I'm laying on the ground, and I can't, I can't move from the waist down, or I, I can't feel anything. Jan is rushed to the hospital. Her injuries are horrific. They didn't know if I'd walk again. Um, I had so many nerves that were damaged, because uh, that bullet, when it hit my bone, it exploded. And so there, I still have lots of shrapnel in there. My hip had to be rebuilt, and a lot of nerves were severed. I've lost probably about a third of the 
nerve and muscle activity in my leg. It takes more than two years for Jan to get over the ordeal, and there aren't just the physical scars to deal with. There was a period of time where I, every time I closed my eyes, it, I'd, be, I'd be reliving it under a different scenario. That was one of the things I had to go through and recover from. The reason Jan Gold is alive today is the tiger was too young, too inexperienced, didn't know how to deal a fatal blow. But at the end of the day, a tiger is a tiger, and it will not have lost its tigerness. For the last eight years, Taiga and Tundra have continued to live in Zoo Boise with no further incidents. To avoid conflict, most captive animals are kept away from humans. But what about those bred specifically to attack, like bulls? Every 7th of July, locals and tourists gather in Pamplona, Spain to outrun a pack of angry bulls. It's a controversial event that dates back to the 16th century. As many as 300 participants are injured each year. 14 have been killed since 1910. In 1995, Matthew Tassio fell while trying to avoid a charging bull. Just 22, Tassio became the first American to die on the streets of Pamplona. Even matadors with years of training can never completely control a powerful bull. In 1947, top bullfighter Manuel Rodriguez Sanchez finally met his match. Going in for the kill, Sanchez was savagely gored his femoral artery slashed by the animal's jagged horns. The man everyone thought could tame the brute force of a bull was pronounced dead hours later. Half a century later, police officer Kenneth Shaw also found out the hard way what it's like to try to stop a 1,400-pound runaway bull. And was on top of me, slamming me into the ground, and I felt the pain go up to my chest. This thing ain't stopping. Just north of Boston, in Lowell, Massachusetts, a controversial event is underway, a bloodless bullfight. In this version of the event, the animals are not killed. Nonetheless, Bulls that are used are much more aggressive than regular farm animals. They're wiry, they're fit, they're athletic, they're fast, they're angry. So the, if you like, threshold for aggression is very different. So it's comparing a Labrador with a pit bull. As this enormous 1,400 pounder waits to face the matador, he gets increasingly worked up. When they're confined, when they're frightened, they get sometimes mean and, and certainly unpredictable. To stress, fear is really the big danger signal for the bulls that will get them to do things that in nature they would never do normally. And for this bull, that means busting out of his trailer one way or another. Nearby, Lowell police officers Maggie Malik and Kenneth Shaw are on duty. Basically, your job was to keep the patrons from not coming from the facility with any type of alcohol or anything like that. Gorgeous, hot, bright, sunny day. We had over 300 cars. We almost had to close the gates because we couldn't fit another car in. Maggie's main concern is that she doesn't have to watch any of the fight. I didn't want to say it because I don't agree with an animal to be antagonized and ridiculed, and I felt this was inhumane.
Their real problem, however, is a few hundred yards away in the bull's trailer. The noise is pushing the animal over the edge. There was a lot of alcohol flowing. There was a lot of banging around and noise and music, and uh, that's pretty nasty cocktail for a bull, really. You have the makings of a, a, a bull that is going to be, if you like, out of his mind with anger. Suddenly, panic rips through the crowd, milling around outside. All of a sudden, I see people start to run and start screaming. Kenneth races around the corner and comes face to face with a half-ton nightmare. Somehow, the angry bull is broken loose. Now, all of a sudden, I'm in a situation where I have to deal with that animal that's running rampant. There's no truth in the belief that red specifically is antagonistic to bulls. Movement is the biggest single factor which triggers a bull attack. The bull zeroes in on a target. The gentleman was basically with his back up against the bed of the pickup truck and the bull just kept slamming him into the back end of the pickup truck. The strength of this animal was truly amazing. If Kenneth doesn't do something quick, the man will be crushed to a pulp. The diamond-like tip of the bull's horns can easily gore into soft tissues. I just started to basically make noises, waving my hands, try to, you know, trying to get its attention. Then turn its attention on me. My adrenaline was just, you know, it just all came so quickly. Charging at full speed is a wall of muscle. It was a scary sight. Nearby, Maggie is unaware that a furious monster is gunning for her partner. Everybody's screaming, there's music going on. You can't really hear anything. It charged me, and I jumped on a vehicle that was close. It slammed off that, that vehicle, and then just bounced off. But I knew it could uh, pack a wallop, so I didn't want to get hit with that. There is no protection against an attack by a determined bull, especially a bull of that breeding of that degree of infuriation, of that degree of temper. Finally, Maggie spots her partner. Kenneth has nowhere to go. They can really hit like a battering ram. Nothing is going to stop them, really. And you'll be punctured. It'll go through your rib cage or some other part of your anatomy. <laughs> They basically threw my body from the side onto the hood of the vehicle to, uh, to get away from its wrath. And that made the, the bull mad. Don't frustrate him and don't antagonize him because you always know that he can pull all the shots. It's frustrated. It looks for something else to demolish. It spots Maggie. He came with a run. He came with a snort. I don't know how to play like that. It's like, oh my god, what do I do with this bull? She zigzags, desperately trying to lose him, but he sticks to her like a shadow. They have this real benefit of almost 360 degrees uh, coverage, so it makes them able probably to react more quickly than humans. So if you stand still, the likelihood is that you won't be attacked. Golly, locked in on my eyes. And that put a chill down my spine. They do this burst of heavy breath out from the nostrils. And this is carrying a chemical message. I'm loaded with testosterone. I'm the, really the king 
guy around here, and you take me on at your peril. The bull loses interest in Maggie and rushes off the stadium grounds, still fuming. Trying to escape, he heads downtown. Oh my God. If the bull can't be stopped, hundreds of lives are now at risk. At a bloodless bullfight in Lowell, Massachusetts, a half-ton bull is on a violent rampage. And now, it's police officer Kenneth Shaw's job to take it down before he reaches the busiest part of town. I'm thinking that this animal is, is gonna basically cause a lot of havoc if we don't stop it. I didn't really even know what I was gonna do. I didn't want anybody else to get hurt. His strength and his power and, and whatever is going on with him. We're not taught in the police academy how to handle it. The only way that I'm gonna be able to take it out was if I hit it in the head. But the bullets barely make a dent. So the bullets would have hit into the side of that animal, caused it pain, but didn't ultimately penetrate and, and cause damage to internal organs. All they would have succeeded in doing would be to infuriate the animal. They have very good armor in the form of their thick skin. The raging bull continues towards the crowd. And I was just hoping that it wasn't going to take a left where all the shopping malls were. Kenneth catches a break. The bull runs off the road and right into an empty parking lot. In an ideal situation, they would have just tried to contain or keep it in that parking lot, let it calm down. The animal is cornered. It panics. And then it spots a familiar foe. The bull would have recognized him as that same individual, no doubt, and it was an unfinished battle. It's now or never for Kenneth. I have to try to take this out. If I know someone else is going to get hurt. But again, the bullets have little effect. This thing ain't stopping. So then all of a sudden it turned and started to do an all-out charge right at me. They will charge through a, literally a brick wall. It was basically literally trying to destroy me. It was trying to kill me. You know, it was bulldozing me and bulldozing me into the ground. Every time that I try to get up, and get off the ground and kind of knew what it was doing. It'd swing its head and swipe at my feet and knock me back on the ground again. The pressure that they're able to exert, they all their weight on your body, um, you're gonna have broken bones and a reshaped face. And the intention is to kill you, is to take you out. All of a sudden I felt the pain go up to my chest, was on top of me, basically slamming me into the ground with its head, with the horn slamming me constantly at the, in my leg area. The incredibly solid neck and shoulder muscles of the bull don't bend or buckle on impact. It hits like a battering ram. Maggie tries to draw the bull away for the second time. Seeing Kenny's shattered uniform, seeing the blood on his skin, I, at that point, was not sure if he had gorged him in a major organ, and that takes you only seconds to bleed out. The bull is momentarily confused by Maggie's shouts. Buying Kenneth just enough time to crawl for cover beside a car. His knee is gorged. It looked like prime rib. And I know that a lot of grout and dirt and soot, it needs a lot of cleaning, a lot of room for infection, tendon repair, maybe fractured bones. Kenneth's in bad shape. Time is ticking. Maggie needs to act now. 
but the bull still wants a piece of Maggie and takes dead aim. So I said, come on, let's bring it on. Let's go get him. And I shot him right between the eyeballs and then on the forehead. Which is actually the location that is used in slaughter, official slaughter of cattle. This time, the shot stuns the half-ton bull. He staggers away to the other end of the lot. Meanwhile, it's not looking good for Kenneth. I looked down and I could see my bones running, running the back of my, my leg. You're gonna be fine. You're gonna be fine. The bull is finally put down when police backup arrives at the scene. Kenneth is rushed to the hospital and goes under the knife. I tore out a piece of my, my quadricep. And then I also received basically a laceration to one of my, my testicles. I could bend one knee, but I couldn't bend the other. Two years later, he finally returns to the police force, a hero. I get the Medal of Valor for basically my, my actions that day. Despite the controversy, bloodless bullfights are still held in some states, including Texas and California. Conservationist Gary Kamasha was lucky to escape alive when he was savagely attacked by a lion on a game reserve. And um, uh, I thought that this was it. I, I thought this, is, this would be the end. The African savanna, home to one of the most feared predators on Earth, the lion. Thousands of people have met their end in the jaws of these killer cats. This pride lives in a game reserve in South Africa's Umpumalanga province. And when food is short or they feel threatened, these big cats can turn man-eating. With lions around, no one can afford to be off guard. Danger is part of the job for 23-year-old conservationist Gary Kamasha. He manages the reserve's lions, and today he has a problem. A lioness is wounded, and she's pregnant. This female, because she was injured and finding it difficult to keep up with the pride to feed and to, and to compete for food around the carcasses and things like that, she was getting very hungry. If Gary tries to treat the lioness, the pride can tear him apart. His plan, to isolate her in an enclosure by luring her in with bait. But the dominant males get to the meat first. Some are her own offspring. Days later, Gary is still waiting. He relaxes with friends and makes a dangerous mistake. I took off my sidearm and put it to the one side to just be more comfortable uh, and not thinking of anything that can happen at that point. But today will be different. The pride is staying outside the enclosure and the hungry lioness grabs the opportunity to feed. She's, she's 
the closer. Gary is delighted she's finally taken the bait. Guys, I'll be back in a couple of minutes. I just want to close the gate. We will... Now we can okay. treat her injury. Come, let's go. I basically thought, okay, this is what we've been hoping for. Let's quickly go and close the gates and make sure that she's constrained inside. But in the rush, he's forgotten the one thing that could protect him in an attack. <clears throat> 150 feet from the enclosure gates, they see the pride. The lioness isn't with them. There she is, behind that bush. Oh. Gary is relieved this plan is finally working. But something is wrong. She's not alone. One of the pride's aggressive young males is inside the enclosure and will attack if threatened. This male was always being a bit edgy and agitated, barking at you and coughing, the typical attack bark if you get too close to him. Getting the young lion out is dangerous, but without treatment, the lioness could die of gangrene. Gary's plan, forcing the young male out by using the truck. So uh, we went into the, the gate, and I tried to get the vehicle between the male and this female, and then push him out so that he could be running out. And once he would be outside, we could place the gates. But the young lion isn't easily intimidated. He's not leaving. Uh, I think what happened at that point, he was looking at the movement of the vehicle. So the vehicle and the people inside was posing a threat to him as well as myself. And instead of him uh, running for the gate, he was just seeing himself being crowded by this whole scenario. I was worried that he might start getting agitated, running up and down, psyching up the female as well, the rest of the pride. Forcing him out with the truck hasn't worked. All Gary can do now is try to flush the lion out himself. Just gonna have to go in there and chase him out. I thought I'd go on foot, use the vehicle as protection so the female couldn't really see what was going on, and then chase him out on foot. It's a risky move especially as Gary still hasn't realized he's forgotten his gun. By trying to flush a young adolescent male on foot is a big mistake. Young males tend to be the biggest troublemakers, you know, lions are not used to being in close proximity to human beings that are not inside of a vehicle. The lion is starting to feel threatened. It could attack at any moment. I was just assuming that this male would just run out, and I wasn't even thinking of him uh, feeling a bit of uh, discomfort. He's, I was entering his comfort zone and his, his personal space. He was essentially cornered because he was in, in a fenced-in area, so that's the time when an, an animal will react out of fear. Hey, hey, hey. Careful, we can. Instead of diverting his, his, his uh, direction towards the gap between myself and the vehicle, he was actually zooming in on me. I did think of that point my sidearm. This was the most stupid thing that I could have done. Uh, I don't know why I took it off. 
Gary tries frantically to get out of the lion's way, but it's too late. He was planning to go for my upper body. I moved back, he misjudged himself. I think that actually, to a certain extent, saved my life. The lion has missed Gary's head, but it locks its vice-like jaws around his leg. His friends, also unarmed, can only watch in horror. Gary has now become human prey. A lion has savagely attacked conservationist Gary Kamash. Unarmed, he must now fight for his life with his bare hands. And I had my hands trying to push his head down and away from me and, and keep him down. It was like a iron vice, a big vice, just clamping around my leg. A lion's jaws can bite with nearly 900 pounds of pressure, enough to snap the spine of its prey with ease. The lion certainly was trying to control him and immobilize him and get him, get him to a point where he could access a more vital area. Outside the enclosure, the pride can smell blood. The pride with trying to figure out what's busy happening, what, where did those, those sounds come from. The pride is becoming restless. If they join in the attack, Gary is finished. Frantic, he tries to pry open the lion's jaws. Well, I tried to put my thumbs into his mouth between his uh, premolars. I couldn't get in him. They were already too close to each other. I just realized there's no way I'll be able to get my leg out of this. Gary's friend, Johan, tries to find anything he can to use as a weapon. But he comes up empty. The pride is getting agitated. They can sense a kill. Some lions are dedicated man-eaters using humans as a regular part of their diet. The hunting instinct kicks in. The attack is on. The rest of the pride was already coming in, and I shouted to my friend, uh, keep the rest of the pride away, keep the rest of the pride away. And, uh, knowing that if they would come in, it would have been the end. Keep the freaking pride away! Uh, I thought that this was it, you know, with the rest of the pride coming in to assist. I thought this, is, this would be the end. I wouldn't be able to fend off the rest of the group, so I was shouting at him, and he jumped out of the vehicle and started throwing uh, pieces of branches and, and rocks. Incredibly, Johan manages to hold the pride back. Okay. But Gary's leg is still locked in the lion's mouth. He needs to do something fast. Desperate, Gary attacks the lion's only weak spot, its eyes. I could just feel when I pressed my thumb into his eye that he was blinking and trying to get out. That was hurting him. The nose and the eyes are very vulnerable. It's the part of them that they have to, at all costs, protect. But the lion won't let go. It fights back with razor-sharp claws. For not only did they, will they shred your flesh like a hot knife through butter, but uh, the infections caused by those claws are, are also very septic and can lead to 
rapid infection and death. A lion's claws carry deadly bacteria that can cause tumors, inflammation of the heart, and kidney failure. I still remember the sound of ripping flesh. And I could see the skin stretching, and I could feel the skin ripping. Time is running out. Oh. Johan has nothing else to throw at the lions. If the pride attacks, Gary is unlikely to escape alive. South African conservationist Gary Kamasha is being ripped apart by a lion. The rest of the pride are about to join the attack. Hey, I can't keep them back any longer. Fearing for his life, Johan has gotten back in the vehicle. The worst moment for me, Johan shouting, uh, I can't fend him anymore, and his door closing, yeah, his door banging, closing up. I realized how close I was to, um, to death. Gary struggles desperately to free himself. He punches the lion in the eye, but it won't let go. And I was just going down on his eye with my fist as hard as I could, and, and putting my thumb into his eyes and pressing down. For a moment, the lion loosens its grip. Gary sees his chance and takes it. I think what he wanted to do was to reposition himself and take me down. When he started opening his mouth, I ripped my leg out of his mouth. Gary, come! Come! Come get him! Come, come. The rest of the pride was very psyched up. Four, five, ten seconds longer than I would have been taken and ripped apart. Adrenaline is coursing through Gary's body, numbing his pain. Only when he's safely away does he realize the severity of his wounds. When I looked down, I saw the piece of flesh hanging out the back of my leg. He ripped some of my tendons out of my arm as well, and I didn't even pick up that I couldn't use my left hand properly. Let's pull over. I'll drive, OK? OK. Just pull over. Over. It takes half an hour to get to the nearest hospital. On the road um, down to the doctor, I, I remember I started feeling very awkward. I started getting a bit nauseous and, and not feeling well. So I was bleeding extensively. Gary gets more than 50 stitches in his leg and arm. He's lucky to be alive. There was a number of things that saved my life that day, and the one thing that was, was definitely was the fact that he was inexperienced and a young uh, lion. And the fact that I, I saw him coming for me and jumped backwards. Just a few weeks later, Gary returns to work on the game reserve. In the meantime, the lioness's wounds has healed naturally, and she's given birth to a healthy litter. Gary's close brush with death has made him realize that on the savanna, you can never drop your guard. I think what it did cause me is to be way more cautious than I was at that point, because I, I can remember I was getting more and more complacent with these animals. Ever since Homo sapiens first walked the African savanna, we have lived in fear of the mighty lion. These superb predators have ruled their territory for over a million years. Unarmed, humans stand little chance. Even today, more than 100 people every year are killed by lions. Humans have always been on the menu of lions throughout history you know, throughout our co-evolution with them. 
But lions are not the only man-eaters here. The hyena is just as deadly. It can eat every part of its victim, even the bones. <laughs> Hyenas are despised because they dig up graves and eat human remains. And feared because they kill the living. In the 1950s, hyenas terrorized a village in Malawi. They killed and devoured 27 people, many of them children. The stealthy man-eaters crept up on villagers as they slept outdoors during hot weather. They grabbed their victims by the head and dragged them off into the bushes to feed. There was little left for devastated families to bury. Hyenas are fearless predators. In 1972, a Malawi school teacher, Yerendas Luggage, was cycling to work when he was taken down by hyenas. He knew there'd be nothing left of him if they dragged him away. He fought as hard as he could, screaming for help. By the time villagers rescued him, he was barely alive. People forget how deadly hyenas can be. Danny Tel Blanche wasn't scared of them until one tried to eat him alive. And I thought, I'm gonna die now. Spring 1998, aircraft pilot Danny Terblanche is enjoying a week's vacation with friends on the Zambezi River. Every year, the group heads off into the wilderness for a taste of adventure. All the time, there's exciting moments uh, because there's a lot of hippo, there's crocodiles, lions, and of course, oh, he does. <laughs> After an action-packed day on the water, the friends pull up for the evening. A ground crew has set up camp and cooked a hearty meal. We thought we had a very successful trip. So we were a very happy bunch of people. It's been great six days. Yeah, especially when you it's the last day of the holiday. Time to celebrate. Some of my friends were wine farmers. And of course, we brought a lot of good wine with us. We heard lions every night. We knew there was quite a lot of lions, but nobody had a gun. Are you sure you're still gonna sleep out here tonight? Yeah, man. Predators are nearby, but Danny won't sleep in a tent. A big mistake. There's a recipe for hyena attacks, and the recipe would be sleeping with your door open, sleeping in your sleeping bag on the ground outside of a tent. Oh, I think you're well done. <laughs> I'm going to call it a night. Good night, gentlemen. Yeah, I sleep well. All right. Yeah, you Cheers. too. Cheers. Good night. You. Every night I slept outside, yes. But uh, with some protection, I had chairs around my mattress. And of course, I had a mosquito net that was hanging from a tree. But a flimsy mosquito net won't stop a hungry man eater. These are animals that can dent a pipe, a one-inch pipe. They can crush it without hurting their teeth. At night, 
the hyena has a huge advantage. It can see in the dark. Hyenas, like, like all nocturnal hunters, have incredible uh, ability to see and smell at night. Night vision is excellent. They're looking for garbage. They're looking for the things that were thrown out after dinner. And they come on to something like a person laying there sleeping. That's a carcass to a hyena. You are a large meal for them. They're not going to check your pulse before they go ahead and grab you. Somebody, they hit me with a, with a plank over my, over my head. When Danny realizes it's a hyena attack, his blood runs cold. If it drags him into the bushes, it could tear him apart in seconds. Danny Terreblanche is on a kayaking holiday on the Zambezi River when he is attacked by a hyena. I've got no weapon, and I think my way of protecting myself is to, is to pull a thick blanket over my head. It doesn't bite my head. A hyena's bite can exert a force of up to 1,000 pounds. They have particularly large teeth, premolars to crush bones, and carnations at the back of the mouth, which slice up meat like scissors. They have the strongest bite of any predator on Earth. Stronger than a lion, stronger than a bear. They go through bone like you and I go through a candy bar. I tried to, to lie on my stomach with, in a crawl position, but it was just instinct. Then it grabbed me by the, by the neck and, and it dragged me. A few feet further into the bushes, and he could be ripped to pieces by the hungry hyena. He will proceed to drag you off and start eating you. That's what would happen. The hyena strategy is to, to kill you and then dismember you and then run away with whatever bits they could. Without the support of the rest of the pack, the hyena cannot fight for its meal. So it retreats. I, f I felt the pain in my head and when I felt it with my hand, I knew there was something terribly wrong. I felt a hole in my head. My biggest fear was that I'm, I lost my ear and I'm going to lose my hearing. And of course, the first thing that goes through one's mind is that I'm going to lose my, my flying career. Luckily, Danny's ear is still in one piece. My ear was still in a mosquito net, hanging by a little piece of, 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 of skin from my head. I think they probably will wash it with some good old cape, dry red wine. <laughs> Desperate to save his ear, his friends bind it back onto the gaping wound. The nearest hospital is in Kariba, 80 miles across rough terrain. They need to hurry. Danny is at grave risk of a deadly infection. Hyenas eat rotting carcasses, and their mouths are crawling with dangerous bacteria. You can imagine the bumps in the road. I don't know how many times I've passed out. Adrenaline from the attack is wearing off. Danny's in shock. I prayed a lot, okay. and I asked God to, to, to help me. And uh, 
that was, I think, that maybe pulled me through. All right, now we're going to get now it takes them nearly nine hours to reach Kariba. The town only has a small, basic hospital. The doctor does what she can to save Danny's ear. She had to, uh, to stitch it back onto my head, but there was no no uh, anesthetics. My friends had to hold me on the table while she, she did the job. That was very, very painful. Danny is then flown back to South Africa, where a plastic surgeon performs three painful operations. His ear is finally restored, and he can resume his flying career. As Danny discovered, on the savanna, Homo sapiens can become just another link in the food chain. <laughs> Humans aren't the usual prey for hyenas and lions, but when food is scarce, these animals will attack almost anything. In 1898, when an epidemic meant other prey was in short supply, two hungry lions launched one of the worst series of attacks ever recorded. The man-eating pair are thought to have killed more than 100 railway workers in Kenya. The lions may have begun by scavenging graves. Then, with a taste for human flesh, they began a bloody rampage that lasted nine months. Work came to a standstill. Night curfews were imposed. Workers hoped high fences and fires would keep them safe. But the lions still got in. They pulled their prey from their beds and dragged them off into the bushes to be devoured. Chief Engineer Lieutenant Colonel John Henry Patterson knew he had to kill the lions if the railway was to be built. He tried for months to catch the savage predators. Then, finally, on the night of December 9, 1898, he managed to shoot the first lion. 20 days later, he killed the second. Patterson became an instant hero. Male lions are extremely dangerous, but the lioness is just as deadly. She is a true hunter of the pride a ruthless, efficient killer. When Bruce Meekall had to hunt a rogue lioness, he soon found out why these predators have such a terrifying reputation. She had bitten down from the top of my head, and I was fighting for my life. Limpopo, South Africa. This lioness is a loner. She's old and hungry. Local villagers are terrified she might start preying on their cattle or on them. The lions are usually persecuted by people because they pose a threat. Usually that threat is to their livestock, to their goats or their cattle. Professional hunters are called in to put her down. Leading the team is conservationist Bruce Meekall. He's sad to have to kill such a magnificent animal. Doing the job humanely 
is his top priority. It's your responsibility to make sure that things are done properly and as ethically as possible. You, got the yeah. you know, make sure that that the animal goes down, you know, in a clean sweep. We had been notified by one of the trackers where the lioness was, so we headed up in our vehicle to that area. There's quite a few things to take into consideration when hunting a lion. Wind direction, the vegetation around you, and obviously the fact that you've got to have a, a you know, clear vision around you. You don't want to be in really dense bush where you can end up in, in a bad situation. Bruce and his crew begin tracking the rogue lioness. So we started walking, looking for signs to see where she was. Tracks, uh, old kills, things like that. But the lioness has probably already picked up the hunter's scent and keeps out of sight. Lions are very good hunters. They're very good at camouflaging themselves. For two days, they search for the big cat, but she remains invisible. The longer it takes to find her, the greater the danger to local villagers. If lions can get away with it, if they have opportunities, they consider humans part of the diet, especially in, in more harsh environments where prey density of their preferred prey is lower. Finally, they work out which way the animal is heading. If they're quick, they just might catch her. Later that morning, we had actually bumped into her, purely through tracking. That enabled us, obviously, to, to get set up uh, to take the shot. Bruce wants to take the lioness out with a single bullet. If he only wounds her, she's likely to attack. Bruce Mikal has been tracking a rogue lioness for two days. He now needs to put her down with a single bullet. The shot was a good shot. But she got up and ran off, went into thick bush. Something has gone very wrong. The bullet hit the lioness, but hasn't killed her of the bullet hadn't done what it was supposed to do. The bullet opens up and, and has a hard impact um, in order to make an instant kill. In this situation, it basically just went straight through. If you didn't kill them the first time and you just wounded them and it wasn't in a, in a vital area and they survived, you would never get a chance again to catch up with them, and, and, and if you did, it would be after they killed another dozen or more people. This is hard for Bruce. What should have been a swift, humane kill has resulted in an angry, injured animal. The animal's adrenaline is up, and by walking in there immediately, you basically putting yourself into a situation where um, she's going to come out and attack you. Just have to be very careful. They decide to give the lioness a chance to calm down. We head back as a safety precaution and got in our vehicles. Right, boys, An hour later, 
Bruce sets off again. He knows that he and his team are now vulnerable. The lioness is on the defensive and could strike at any moment. When a lion is badly injured, they'll retreat two or three times at the most before they'll turn and they'll, and they'll attack, whether you have 100 people with you or whether it's one or two people. The lioness has the hunters in her sights. She waits patiently for them to come closer. Her pursuers are now her prey. cover a distance of 100 meters in about six seconds. So there's not much chance to get into any position. So you basically turn point and take your shot. By the time I reloaded to, to take the second shot, she had jumped onto me. The attack is savage. The lioness goes straight for Bruce's head. The main thing that they go for are the, is the most vital spot and the most vulnerable spot, and that's the neck and the head. As we came down towards the ground, she had already had her mouth over my head and bit me on the back of my head. With the impact of us hitting the ground, my head bounced out of mouth. I to see teeth and saliva and hair and, I mean, the sound that they make is incredibly loud. The others can't fire. They could hit Bruce. They, they fling you around like a ragdoll. With their strength and power, every time they hit you, your whole body has been thrown about. She would have been feeling for his vertebrae so she could puncture the and sever the spinal cord. The wounded cat is in a frenzy. You don't know what's happening. You're just trying to get a grip of the whole situation around you and what to do in order to survive. The lioness is much stronger than Bruce. The moment he weakens, she will kill him. Mikol has been savagely attacked by a wounded lioness. His team can't shoot her because they might kill him. He's become human prey. Once they go into attack mode, they don't turn back. And then they're gonna press that attack until, until either you're dead or they're dead. All you're thinking about is trying to survive, trying to get yourself into a position of maybe having some a, 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 an inch of control. He must try to keep the lioness from moving long enough for his team to shoot her without hitting him. Bruce is an experienced hunter. He knows the lioness will try to gut him with her back claws. My natural instinct was to pick my legs up so she didn't disembowel me. And when she came for my face, that's when I stuck my arm in her mouth. Bruce has disabled two of her deadly weapons, her teeth and back claws. He hugs the lioness tight to immobilize her. The ordeal is finally over. But even though she nearly killed him, Bruce can't help regretting that this superb creature 
had to be put down. In the instance when she had died, there is... Being so close, there is definitely a, a feeling that goes through you of what's happened to you and what's happened to her. Shock sets in quickly. Bruce needs urgent medical attention. He has torn veins and over 40 lacerations. His injuries are life-threatening. A lion's saliva carries bacteria, which can cause terrible infection and internal bleeding. I spent five and a half hours in surgery. I came out of hospital after one and a half to two weeks. You know, then it's a long recovery, I think, from there, uh, mentally and physically. Within a couple of months, I'd healed up. I was able to use, you know, my arm again and, 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 a, and a bit of therapy that, you know, that helped. On the mental side, I think you've got to accept what's happened to you and move forward. You know, there's very few first-hand accounts like that because lions usually, when they attack like that, they usually kill their victim. Bruce is lucky to survive. Despite his close brush with death, he goes back to work as a conservation manager in a savanna. But he's given up hunting for good. It's hard to, to go back to doing what you were doing after an incident like that. There's definitely a sense of respect and a sense of fear. Lions and hyenas can kill a person in seconds, but attacks are rare. Normally, these predators will avoid us. It's only when food is scarce or they feel threatened that they strike. And when they do, the results are devastating. I realized how close I was to death that day. Um, I think it, it may, gave me a lot of more respect for life. It, it made me realizing that every moment, any mo moment could be your last moment. Surprisingly, many survivors don't blame the animals. I've got uh, uh, more respect for hyenas because it's an open opportunistic killer. I have more respect for, uh, for hyenas, and, and I won't take a chance. It will give them a chance. On a canoeing holiday in the Canadian wilderness, the Dalventhal family was savagely attacked by a lone wolf. There was nothing we could do to stop a wolf that wanted to eat us. Algonquin Park, Ontario. A vast landscape of forests, lakes, and rivers. A popular destination for hikers and nature lovers. And home to predators including the eastern wolf. The conventional wisdom in North America is that wolves are basically harmless. But it became crystal clear that there were circumstances under which the wolves would be dangerous. This adult wolf has been expelled from his pack. Forced to fend for himself, he's become an opportunistic predator scavenging kills and raiding campsites. And he's starting to lose his natural fear of people. That's it, just keep paddling straight on in. How you doing, guys? Yeah, just follow me in. <laughs> the Dalventhal family is near the end of a nine-day canoe trip, some of the park's most remote areas. All right, then. We wanted to get away from people, get um, away from human contact, really get as much as possible into nature to appreciate it as a family. Yeah, dig right in there. It had been one of the best trips. 
probably one of the high points of, of our lives together as a family. As the day ends, the Dalventhals look for a place to set up camp. Hey, Tracy, come on right over here. The perfect spot, isn't it? Great job, guys. They're unaware that something else has also picked this site. The wolf gravitated to the campsite because that was a place where in the past it may have smelled food, experienced food. Although both parents just want to kick back and relax, their older boys have plans of their own. We wanted to go out on the water and see the sunset. And our parents had very strict rule that uh, me and my brother Eli were not allowed out in the canoes without one of them in the canoe. So we needed to convince one of our parents to go out with us. What do you say, Mom? We're going to stay here and make dinner, and you boys go ahead. Tom and his two older sons set off in the canoe. He has no idea a hungry wolf may now be sizing up their little brother. About 80% of the attacks are aimed at children. And children are being taken while they are still struggling and screaming and are being carried off. As Tom and his boys paddle further away from their campsite, they bump into other canoeists who tell them about an old Algonquin Park tradition. You ready? Let's do it. The wolf call. We sort of bunched all the canoes together and started howling, you know, more or less in unison, um, doing our best to sound like wolves. <laughs> when you howl, you let the pack know that you are another wolf and you're encroaching on its territory. The lone wolf closes in, possibly worried that rivals may attempt to steal his tempting evening meal. The forest around the site was really thick. You couldn't see into the forest at all. And I heard something and just saw the side of something. Tom arrives back with his older sons. The wolf is likely scared away for now. Hi, boys. Time for bed. We got a long day tomorrow. It's been such a perfect evening that Tom and Tracy decide not to pitch the tents. The Delventhals will sleep under the stars. <laughs> But sleeping outside makes the family vulnerable. My mom put Willem, who was only three, in between me and Eli, you know, who were considerably larger than him. Me, Willem, and Eli were down in our own little group. And I am going to sleep like a log. Tom and I, we were lying out under the stars and agreed that it was the most peaceful, grounded, um, safe that we've ever felt in our lives. And I talked about how blessed we were, that this was a glorious place. There is something quite wonderful about lying down and seeing the stars. But I was 12, and I was a little bit more scared of the world and scared of the dark. The ravenous wolf bides his time. He waits until the family is still. His sights are firmly set on the children. I was dreaming that I was walking through the woods with my parents. And it was sunny, and we were just sort of walking and talking. Finally, the wolf makes his move. He zeroes in on the most accessible prey, Zack. While I was dreaming, there was definitely a sensation of pressure on my face. The wolf 
as a killing machine is extremely powerful. They really slice through tissues and meat and muscles and tendons. It's very severe. Incredibly, Zach keeps on sleeping. And it felt like I was being um, dragged. <laughs> felt like I was sort of strapped to the front of a jet. Everything started rushing by really, really quickly. And that was the point when I woke up. Startled, the wolf runs back into the forest. This one long, ripping scream. It was blood curling. Zach! Zach, what's wrong? What's wrong? What is it? He kept saying something bit me. What is it? But they still have no idea what bit him. It was at that point that my thermals were getting wet and warm. And he started saying, I can't breathe, I can't breathe, I can't breathe. And so I realized that he was bleeding profusely from the face. I sat there trying to gather myself, and I looked through the darkness to where they were huddled together, and then I saw the wolf. Yeah! Yeah! Go on! I was being as big as I could be and as loud as I could be. I had to get away from my wife and child. He ran right past us, and we could hear it running into the woods and whacking trees and bushes and stuff. And I was trying to hold Zach and figure out what was going on. The animal retreats. The wolf! And I immediately started panicking. Could kill the whole family. I kept just pulling him down and whispering, you have to stay calm. We have to stay calm. We have to stay quiet. We have to know where it is. But with only a flashlight, the family has no idea where the wolf is hiding, whether it's vanished or simply biding its time. Wolves have a marvelous tapetum lucidum, which is the technical name for a membrane in the back of the eye which reflects light. And so wolves can see at night much better than we can. The wolf is probably watching the family's every move. He will choose the best moment to resume his attack. I thought we were all gonna die. I thought that there was nothing we could do to stop a wolf that wanted to eat us. On a canoeing trip to Algonquin Park, Ontario, the Delventhal family has fought off a savage attack by a lone wolf. Oh, no. yeah, yeah, go on. Yeah, yeah, go on. They're terrified it will strike again. The first thing I found was, was my paddle was the biggest of all of the paddles. Yeah, yeah. And I went back to where he had disappeared. Um, and stood there for about uh, half a minute until I was satisfied that um, he was gone. My dad came up in front of me and shone the light in my face. Let me see, let me see. Let me see, let me see his eyes. The first thing I saw was the terror and the fear in his eyes. And I could see that his cheek was totally torn through. I just kind of stopped and said, oh, my god. I mean, it was slow, and it was horrified and hopeless. And it was all there, and the oh, my god, and the look on his face. And I knew it was worse than I thought it was. Again, the hungry wolf emerges from the forest. Now he moves in for the kill. And my dad turned and charged him and followed it out into the woods. It was really scary, but I was going to beat him. I'm gonna destroy it. Yeah!
The trees wrapped around him, and he was gone. He disappeared. I thought, if he doesn't come back, how am I going to protect these kids on my own? My immediate thought was that I wasn't going to see him again. darkest night I can ever remember, but my, all of my senses were, were really, really sharpened, and I felt like um, I could see exactly where he was. Armed with his makeshift weapon, Tom now has the upper hand. Wolves, in all their killing activities, have to respect one thing. They're basically hypochondriacs. Safety for them is paramount. Self-preservation wins over hunger. The animal retreats for now. Seizing the moment, the Delventhals make their escape. I knew, at least, the wolf couldn't get us now. The family may have escaped the wolf's jaws, but Zack is still in terrible danger. He's losing blood fast. Hey, Zach, hold on. Hold on, Zach. You're all right. I thought about dying, so I just sort of peacefully lying in the boat and, and figured I could slip away now and, and it would be easy. What changed my thinking was thinking about my family and thinking about how much they would all miss me. I was very aware that he might have lost a lot of blood um, and that there was a lot further to go. We couldn't find our way out. And um, that was just feeling like uh, uh, incredible powerlessness on my part. I was really angry at myself, frustrated with myself, and frustrated with the situation. After three long hours, the family sees a glimmer of light. They arrive at a lodge, but the hospital is still another four hours away. Zach undergoes four hours of emergency surgery. His nose is broken in five places, and it takes over 80 stitches to repair his badly lacerated face. Sheer luck that the wolf didn't grab part of the neck. With the tremendous bite force of the wolf, Zach would not have survived that. Very lucky. They took Zachariah into a, a triage room, and um, it was that moment, it was the first time that I looked at him because I thought, okay, now we're safe, and I can see. And his face was just ripped apart. Even after the doctor had Zach and was doing what he could to, to put Zach's face back together again, the reaction was, um, well, it couldn't have been a wolf. And, and they treated me very much like I was hallucinating uh, or just a... a stupid geek from the city or, you know, somebody who just didn't understand, obviously, because wolves don't do that. The scars themselves really aren't that visible. The psychological trauma leads to months of severe panic attacks. The therapist said, 
what happened is deep and primal because you're supposed to be safe when you're asleep. He didn't know it was coming. None of us knew it was coming. Park rangers decide the lone wolf poses a serious threat to other campers. Five days after the attack, they find the animal they believe terrorized the Delventhals and shoot it dead. But Zack doesn't blame the wolf for what happened. I'm not really any more or less afraid of wolves than I was before. And I have great respect for them and a great admiration for them. But they're always potentially dangerous. <laughs> Throughout history, wolf attacks have been the stuff of nightmare and legend. No ordinary creatures. In mythology, they often represented evil, even the Antichrist. Not even death could safeguard people from the wolf's jaws. In 16th century Scotland, bodies were often buried on islands to stop wolves digging them up and eating them. No European settlement, it seemed, was safe. In 1879, in a village in southern Finland, a pair of wolves went on a bloody rampage. as many as 35 children were killed. Eventually, the Finnish army was called in, but the wolves proved elusive. It took two long years to halt their terrifying reign. The female wolf was shot dead. The alpha male poisoned. By hunting in packs, Wolves are highly efficient killers. Sometimes not even a gun will stop them dead. A woodsman living in Springfield, Missouri in the early 1900s learned this the hard way. Ambushed by a furious wolf pack, he fought a heroic battle for his life, but overpowered before he could reload his rifle. He was later found ripped apart, surrounded by five dead wolves. Ever since the first white settlers arrived in North America, wolves have been relentlessly hunted and killed. But in their place, their canine cousin, the coyote, has flourished. Increasingly, the ever-adaptable coyote has moved into urban areas. And increasingly, humans come face to face with them. One afternoon in his yard, Jimmy Hawthorne ran into a wild coyote, a coyote with rabies. I couldn't believe what was happening. I knew I'd be bitten. It was scary. This coyote has lost all sense of reality. He's suffering from rabies. The disease in his brain has eradicated any fear of people. All he wants to do is attack. Most likely, the coyote encountered a rabid raccoon. They tangled, and the raccoon bit the coyote. The rabid animal has left his natural habitat behind. He's now in the residential neighborhood of Lanaxa, Virginia and is a deadly threat to anyone who crosses his path. Forty-seven-year-old Jimmy Hawthorne is working in his yard on a lazy Sunday afternoon. His wife is inside, taking a nap. It was a normal day. I was actually using the lawnmower to blow the leaves off the yard. Jimmy is completely unaware that he's being watched. I probably see coyotes once a month, and then when they see you, they're gone. They're scared of humans. 
but not this coyote. <laughs> Driven by the lethal virus, he's desperate to bite anything or anyone. Rabies virus uh, infection is transmitted in the saliva and uh, often deposited in skin, subcutaneous tissues or muscle, and then eventually uh, uh, spreads along nerves into the central nervous system. The diseased coyote closes in on Jimmy. I was just sort of in my own little world, riding on a piece of equipment, and it startled me. And then my first thought was, it was a German Shepherd. And then I looked and I said, oh my goodness, it's a coyote. Horrified, Jimmy realizes this coyote is rabid. At that point, it was just terror, scary. Rabies is almost always fatal, if not treated immediately. Well, there have only been six survivors of rabies. We don't fully understand uh, why the outcome is always fatal, but clearly the immune response isn't sufficient to clear the viral infection. It was driving the mole as fast as it would go. The coyote was having no trouble keeping up. The coyote kept circling the mole. Fueled by a wave of aggression, Coyote seizes opportunity and strikes. He bit my boot. I felt, I felt him bite the boot. I mean, I couldn't believe what was happening. I just remember that moment of fear, of terror. It was scary. Luckily, the coyote's bite doesn't pierce Jimmy's thick leather boot. Jimmy needs to make it home before it does. But then, His mower runs out of gas and stops dead. My thoughts were, oh my goodness, it's something scares you to death. And then it's, it's like you have to take care of yourself, protect yourself. Jimmy must either risk running for his life or taking on the rabid animal. This animal might weigh 50 pounds, and I weigh 240. If it gets bad enough, you know, I'll, I'll just tear him apart with my hand. But I knew I'd be bitten. You don't see animals come up to you. I mean, I've been in the woods my whole life. Deer don't walk up to you. Rabbits don't walk up to you. This animal had no fear of man. He would come around the tractor. You know, I, I didn't want him to bite me on the back of my leg, and I just turned around and faced him, and he came at me, and I kicked him. Hit! That's when he sort of hollered, yipped, and went into the thicket. Because of his swelling brain, the rabid coyote is suffering terrible headaches. Jimmy's kick further disorients him. Jimmy's bought some time. but only a little. I looked around and found a big stick about eight foot long. And I said, well, I can use this to keep him off of And he was aggressive, extremely aggressive. Coyotes, canine teeth, are so much longer than, say, a Doberman. They're prepared to hunt and kill. Wielding the stick, Jimmy scores a direct hit to the coyote's head. The crazed animal retreats, for now. Jimmy races for the house, but the door is locked. His wife still asleep. And the rabid coyote isn't yet done with Jimmy. I'm knocking on the door, and then I see him running across the front yard coming back. The ever more aggressive coyote closes in for the kill. <laughs> 
while mowing his lawn one Sunday afternoon. Virginian Jimmy Hawthorne is fought off an attack by a rabid coyote. Locked out of his house, Jimmy's now trapped by the deadly animal. A rabies victim suffers agonizing spasms in the throat, making it almost impossible to swallow. They develop neurological impairment and paralysis, finally progressing to coma, then death. Jimmy pounds on the door one last time to wake up his wife. And thank goodness she got the door open. And I went in and, and I told her there's a rabbit coyote out there. And I was looking for a gun. The coyote refuses to give up. The rabies has infused him with blind courage. All he knows is he needs to bite. Jimmy has to end the battle, now. In the initial stages, it's panic, fear, terror. Honey, you stay inside. You're scared. And then that went away. It goes from fear to aggression. It almost makes you angry. Leaving the sanctuary of home, Jimmy goes in search of the deranged animal. But this time, he's prepared. Just a reflex action, I shot him. Oh, he killed him. When the animal is tested, experts confirm the rabies virus. Thankfully, Jimmy is healthy. But the psychological trauma remains. When I'd go to bed, I'd close my eyes and I would see the coyote coming at me. <laughs> Now, when doing the gardening, Jimmy and his wife are always on guard, just in case. When the news originally did the story, when it, when it happened, they, they said, how do you feel about that? And I said, well, you know, I would have rather been a, a lottery winner. <laughs> so. It was amazing to me how everything is nice. You're at home. It's a Sunday. You're working on your property. Everything's calm, and then everything turns into chaos. It's scary. You know? Rabies has terrified people for thousands of years. In the 16th century, a deadly epidemic swept across Europe. Stories of horrific attacks by mad animals foaming at the mouth entered popular folklore. Peasants in the countryside faced the greatest risk, but not even cities were safe. In 1450 in Paris, a pack of wolves, some probably rabid, created blind panic when they breached the city walls. 40 people were bitten and killed. The ferocious pack was lured into the heart of the city, close to Notre Dame Cathedral. There, a mob hell-bent on revenge, stoned and speared the wolves to death. While the wolf and coyote have always posed a threat to humans in parts of North America, there's a much more dangerous animal at large. The powerful cougar, also known as a puma, or mountain lion is thought to have killed at least 18 people since records began. Aniela was almost one of them. While on a mountain bike ride with her friend, a cougar pounced and tried to snap her neck. 
and you think, this is just a nightmare. I told myself I'd rather die. The rugged canyons of Whiting Ranch Wilderness Park are a big draw for thrill-seeking mountain bikers. But here, taking a tumble is not the only hazard. The park is home to some spectacular and dangerous wildlife, including the feared cougar. California Fish and Game uh, gives a, a range of population from four to 6,000 cougars in California. This 110-pound male cougar works alone. They're very good at being top predators and, uh, and surviving in the landscape. Their quickness, their agility, their smoothness of movement, uh, they're just good at that. The cougar has just taken a fresh kill they will immediately take them off into the, the brush, and that gives them cover and uh, allows them to feed in peace. One cougar will have a, a territory of roughly 30 to 50 or more square miles. The big cat buries what he doesn't eat for another time. He'll attack anything that threatens his food cache. even humans. Aniela, a personal trainer and ex-Marine, and her friend Deb Nichols meet up for a biking excursion. They choose Cactus Hill Trail because of its exciting twists and turns. Anne and I got together because we have common r riding styles. We um, tend to just like to ride hard and not talk a lot. I tend to take up sports where there's usually some rough play. <laughs> you have to be willing to get dirty, have to be willing to, you know, get cuts and scrapes and maybe some poison oak along the way. Um, but I love it for the adventure. But today, Cactus Hill Trail will take them on a journey they won't soon forget. Ann and Debbie are heading straight into a death trap. We were just kind of, you know, coming into the downhill section, we were gonna finish the ride soon. All the climbing is done. Um, and our goal was to make it out before it got dark. The cougar jealously guards its precious food. Mountain lions don't move very far uh, from their kills once they've uh, cached the kill, they tend to stay relatively nearby. Just up the trail, another cyclist discovers an abandoned bicycle. Hello. He has no idea who it belongs to. As I was um, first turning down that trail, Cactus Trail, when I came around one of the blind corners, we actually saw a man standing with his bike and then the second bike with no person. And my instinct was that they had stopped and that his friend was going to the bathroom. So honestly, I didn't really take it very seriously. The cougar's heightened sense of hearing picks up the noisy cyclists. They're invading his territory. Debbie falls behind. The distance between them has made both more vulnerable. Thinking his food cache is threatened, the mountain lion moves into attack mode. As I was moving down the trail, what caught my attention was I saw a flash of movement. I saw kind of a reddish brown fur. Initially thought that I had startled a deer and then the impact. 
cougar can leap a, a great distance in the realm of 20 to 30 feet and will jump on their back and uh, bite the back of the neck. The only thing I can liken it to would be if you're riding your bike and you got hit by a car from behind. That's what it felt like to me. I mean, the impact was unbelievable. I was face down and he was trying to bite at the back of my neck and I knew, okay, this isn't a deer. The lion's impetus is to kill as quickly and as efficiently as possible because that reduces its own energy expenditure and its own uh, chance of harm. I just couldn't believe that, that had just happened to me. And think, this is just a nightmare. This can't really be happening. You can't wrap your brain around it. Anne's helmet protects her for now. But the cougar is determined to win this battle. If they don't kill with the first bite, they may move uh, their bite gradually around to the, to the front of the throat and uh, uh, take the prey down by asphyxiation. You know, it was like nothing I've ever experienced before in my life. It was so completely overpowering. I could feel it actually hanging on to my shoulders. The uh, lion's claws were dug into each of my shoulders, and he was trying to bite at the back of my neck. He was able to manipulate and move me around, um, release his grip and grab on again and just drag me. I could hear Anne's cry screaming, um, and it sounded unusual. It sounded like a siren over and over, and then just within an instant, I came around the corner and saw the mountain lion. Debbie needs to think fast. In sheer desperation, she tries to scare the animal away. He didn't even flinch. They're very focused predators. They, they don't get distracted easily. They uh, have to finish what they start. Risking her own life, Debbie does the only thing she can think of. When I grabbed her leg, I thought, you know, it was going to be something that would you know, alarm him at least, but it didn't. It didn't seem to phase him. You know, all it would have taken is one swipe from that lion to take Debbie out. And she put herself in that situation where that was a very strong possibility. And I, you know, had a death grip on the calf area. I was just amazed at his strength. I just remember watching her face and watching her hanging onto my leg and screaming at the top of her lungs. Debbie's frantic attempts aren't working. She can't pry her friend loose. I was very aware that he just basically ripped my face off. An adult male cougar's powerful jaws are comprised of 30 razor-sharp teeth. Measuring as long as two inches, these massive canines are used to deliver a lethal bite. The other teeth are specialized in slicing and shearing flesh. They're able to crush uh, leg bones, femurs, uh, large bones, and, and commonly eat the entire skull. They're very, very strong. Anne is fighting a highly motivated killer and losing. To be honest, that was the only time. It was for a split second, but I, I basically told myself I'd rather die. I don't remember anything but his tail smacking and his eyes. I'm thinking, I'm so close and I'm screaming so loud. Why don't you let go of you know, her face? A group of cyclists up the trail hear Debbie's screams. They arrive with Anne's life hanging by a thread. I can't hold her much longer. I kept repeating that. I can't hold her much longer. One of the cyclists calls for help as the others join in the fight. But it's almost too late. The animal's large canine sink into Anne's throat. Once he locked down, things started to go black. You know, I started kind of seeing stars. And uh, I knew that that was going to be the end. Anne Yella is now on the edge of death, and her friend 
is powerless to help. Aniella has been savagely attacked by a cougar in a California national park. Her best friend and two passing cyclists struggle to save her before it's too late. Dear God, please give me the strength to hold on to her. He's eventually gonna let go. But the cougar is determined to finish the job. Their focus is intense, even to the point of ignoring a certain amount of negative stimuli, rocks and sticks and things like that. They're very focused, but they do recognize that they're getting hit, and, uh, and at some point, they potentially will give up. One of the rocks finally hits its mark. The cougar relents and lets go. The attack may be over, but Anne's struggle to survive isn't. She needs medical attention urgently. Stay, stay down. Stay down. Come here When I came to, uh, you know, I was lying on my back at that point, and I felt as though I was drowning, and we realized that it was blood. Come on. Debbie is also fearful the cougar may want to finish what he started. Hold her next to him. Immediately thought, I just want to get out of this area. I felt very uneasy that he probably hadn't left, but that, you know, he was close by. They don't get rewarded by giving up easily. All of their evolutionary history dictates that once they start, they, uh, they have to stick with it. The paramedics arrive at the scene, but they fear she may not make it to the hospital in time. My neck hurt so bad. Um, just every muscle was just torn. That's what it felt like. You know, it was so painful to even try to lift my head an inch. And I just said to her, Ann, you're going to be, you're going to make it. You're going to be fine. It's going to be OK. The cougar stays in the area, still protecting his food cache, while Ann is airlifted to the hospital. Surgeons tell Anne that the cougar's bites were millimeters away from ending her life. My plastic surgeon told me he found 40 bite wounds to my neck alone, and then I had, obviously, severe wounds to my face. It wasn't going to be a quick fix. This is not like one surgery, I'm back to normal. And then I realized I'm not ever going to be back to normal. Later that evening, park rangers locate the owner of the abandoned bicycle. He had been making his way down Cactus Hill Trail when his chain came off. Unaware, he was being watched. The animal struck with deadly force. The cougar likely snapped his victim's spinal cord in one bite. Gosh, just I can't believe that I'm still here. It kind of helped me to be so thankful that I was still alive, to realize that here this adult man had been killed, and I made it. A team of park rangers has no choice but to track the man-eater. He shot dead not 50 yards from his first kill. Unwilling until death to give it up. I think they're gorgeous animals. I have a lot of respect for what they're capable of. Appreciating that they need their space too. An experience like this obviously makes you appreciate your friends. Debbie, specifically, she risked her own life. That's true friendship. Their domestic cousins may be household pets, but in the wild, hunger or disease can occasionally drive these animals to target human prey. 